Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage our moderator, Miles O'Brien. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Thank you to ExxonMobil for the, uh, the nice spread out there. And thank you, uh, Mother Nature, for the sunshine. After um, arriving here yesterday in Southern California, they say it doesn't rain in California. And I went up to Palmdale, of all places. It was raining there. And people were looking up at the sky going, what's that? Um, anyway, so we're, we're back. We have a couple of uh, very interesting sessions coming up. I uh, wanted to remind you we are rolling out a series of these commercials. Just to remind you what it's all about, there's been a series of regional Grand Challenges competitions. Students at each regional summit uh, competed in a design competition. The theme was improving human well-being in the developing world. Uh, the winners of the previous competitions have been invited to present their winning project in the form of commercials. And this is going to be judged during the course of this two-day uh, summit. So without further ado, let's pause for a commercial break and watch commercial number two. Chances are, if you've been a university student in the last decade or so, you've been in a large lecture like this one. Hundreds of students from a variety of educational backgrounds, all packed into a lecture hall where students are often treated much more like a number in the system than as an individual learner. These large lectures are often used for introductory courses. For advanced students, the pace is slow and boring. For others, the course may move too quickly, but the number of students in the class makes it too intimidating for shy students to stop the lecture to ask a question. In this video, I will introduce the CASEL system, the concept analysis, student tracking, and learning evaluation system. This system is designed to augment traditional instruction and is an approach to advancing personalized learning. I'm Dr. Ricky Castles, and this work stems from my dissertation research completed this spring. Education can be thought of as a closed loop feedback controller. Instructors determine what information they want to impart to their students and how that information will be presented. 
They then deploy their teaching strategy to the students and measure the results using tests, assignments, and other evaluation mechanisms, which can be thought of as sensors. Once knowledge gaps are identified between what students have learned and the knowledge intended to be imparted, the ideal educational system then readdresses these topics with the students in an attempt to close the loop. The problem in most educational systems is that the loop is never closed. The CASEL system follows the feedback controller model by using concept maps and concept inventories in a novel way. The foundation of the evaluation system is a comprehensive knowledge map which graphically depicts all of the concepts and relationships that the faculty desire to impart to their students. In a similar manner to the work currently being done on developing a body of knowledge in various subject areas, this should be done in consultation with a panel of subject matter experts and by drawing from the appropriate literature. Once the comprehensive concept maps are developed, appropriate multimedia content should be embedded in the comprehensive map so that a repository is created containing instructional tools for teaching each of the concepts and relationships. These multimedia resources can be used as part of a customized tutorial sequence prescribed to students in order to fill in any gaps identified in their conceptual understanding. The elements of the comprehensive knowledge map are then coupled with questions and answers in a multiple choice concept inventory. Students' responses to concept inventory questions help to identify conceptual misunderstanding that students may have. The concept inventory is then easily deployed in a computer-based assessment. Once students have gone through the curriculum, they answer the concept inventory questions online. The CASEL system begins with a comprehensive knowledge map and then removes concept nodes and relationship links appropriately as student misconceptions are identified, resulting in a student map for each learner that identifies his or her knowledge of course concepts. The knowledge gaps identified are then used to determine the appropriate tutorial sequence. The CASEL system has several advantages. First, the system customizes the learning environment to the individual based upon his or her conceptual understanding and his or her learning styles and preferences. Second, the system is outcomes driven and independent of the instructional methods used to reach those outcomes. Third, the CASEL system allows for aggregate assessment of groups of students, allowing educators the opportunity to see which percentages of their students are learning each topic and to perform analyses of student performance based upon various demographics. Finally, the system recognizes that students learn from many sources outside the classroom, and so long as students know the various concepts, it does not matter the source of that information. At the April 2010 Regional Summit on the Grand Challenges in Phoenix, I asked the panel on education how we could account for learning that happens outside the classroom and what techniques could be used. Without knowing about my work at the time, Dr. Norman Fortenberry, the founding director of the Center for the Advancement of, of Scholarship on Engineering Education, responded with the following. Even more accurate, more thoughtful, authentic, as the point was made earlier, authentic assessments. One small piece of that is the work that's been done over the past 10 years now with concept tests. Um, very short tests of what student, do, they, do people actually understand the concepts underlying a particular set of problems. Um, that's, that's a piece of it, but we need to do much more in that area. Over time, the system will need to be expanded to include concept maps and inventories from more disciplines. Currently, the system has been tested by analyzing the conceptual knowledge of over 1,600 students in two introductory engineering courses at Virginia Tech. In order to develop the customized tutorial capability of the system, multimedia content and a tutorial engine will need to be added to the system. To ensure the robustness of the system, more universities and industry partners will be invited to use the system in their context. The developers also intend to showcase the system at upcoming conferences by developing workshops for an upcoming American Society for Engineering Education conference and the Frontiers in Education conference. All right, that's commercial number two. We'll keep you posted on how this uh, goes on. I'm not exactly sure the judging process. I'm going to get some information for you on that, exactly how they're going to be judged. But in, if, if you want to uh, tweet on it, we can do that. Please join in the conversation. We've appreciated your tweets already. Oh, you remember the hashtag, right? Do you? Come on. Hashtag is? What? <laughs> NAEGC 2010. NAEGC 2010. We'd love to hear from you all. Uh, I thought you were all going to do that in unison. Jeez. All right, so this afternoon, we're going to talk about innovation and then policy. I guess we could call it the best of times and the worst of times. We live in a country that is 
politically paralyzed. I think we can all agree on that. The two parties seemingly incapable of uh, coming to any sort of compromise. The Tea Party bringing the kettle to a boil. Uh, and, um, and yet, in spite of all this, and I mean in spite, I think, the U.S. still remains a seemingly endless fund of innovation, uh, despite all our efforts to tamp it down. I guess our secret sauce contains a mix of um, higher education that is uh, the envy of the world, uh, some great, sometimes wacky ideas, throw it all into the free market pot, you know, a little um, have some risk-loving entrepreneurs, add a smidge of capital, and voila, we change the world and, and someone makes a fortune. So innovation, what is it? You know, Steve Jobs talks about innovation a lot. The guy who gives, who gives me this little innovative thing. Innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower, says Jobs, and it is the ability to see change as an opportunity, not as a threat. His competitor up in Seattle, Bill Gates, says, never before in history has innovation offered the promise of so much to so many in so short a time. Of course, that all makes it sound easy. It isn't always so. So how will innovation lead us to some real-world solutions to the grand challenges that we're focused on here over this two-day summit? What is the best way to spark these innovative ideas, nurture them along, and ensure they're leading us ultimately in the right direction? It's my pleasure to uh, kick off this technology panel by introducing our keynote speaker for the innovation panel, the Chief Executive Officer of Gilead, Dr. John Martin. Thank you. Thanks, Miles. And uh, also thank, like to thank Dean Yortzos and the National Academy for including me in a panel that is uh, very diverse, as you'll see coming up. Um, it's also a pleasure to be here and to see how well this is attended and how many people are really interested in the topic of innovation. So the company I represent, Gilead Sciences, is best known for its um, uh, innovative products that address some me medical needs, and, and the majority of our products are in the area of infectious diseases. So we have products for HIV, for uh, hepatitis B virus infection, and in the general public we're most famous for Tamiflu. We launched Tamiflu about 11 years ago, and it's uh, active against the various pandemic strains of influenza. So I'm sure all of you read about that in the newspaper because of the government stockpiling, a lot of concerns of pandemic uh, uh, broad influenza in the country. So uh, the, uh, as Miles was talking about uh, the political climate, it does uh, give uh, to our industry its biggest challenge, and that's the industry of uh, coming up with biomedical products, whether it be drugs, devices, or uh, diagnostics, is the uh, uh, difficult to get funding for innovation now. And things typically go in cycles, and as the economy recovers, hopefully that will uh, improve because we really do uh, feel that all Gilead is fine, we have great cash flow, that the uh, smaller companies that are st starting up in collaborations with uh, various university people, that it's harder and harder to get the funding to bring products all the way through the process. And just by way of example, uh, several examples, uh, if you count failures of drugs in development, the total cost of developing a drug is over a billion dollars. And companies starting up not having revenues and earnings, where do they find the money? And we're a good example. We've been around 23 years, but only the eight, last eight years have been profitable. The first 15 years we lost money. And during that time, we spent almost $2 billion. And our retained earnings, or our accumulated loss, we should say, was uh, our loss was about three quarters of a billion dollars. So we had access to capital markets at the same time that there have been all the wonderful scientific innovations the last couple of decades that have allowed us to come up with uh, very many interesting products. And I should say for uh, people that aren't in our industry, um, they often think that someone discovers a drug and it just becomes a drug. And nothing could be really further from the reality. Uh, chemists and biologists and other scientists collaborating will come up with molecules that are inhibitors of a biological process, but changing that into a drug is a multidisciplinary, multi-year process. And when the pill's on the market, you tend to think as the pill's the drug, but the drug as far as our industry or a physician is concerned is the data described in the package insert. So the skill that we innovate over the 10 years of drug development at every step to come up with the right scientific experiments to define the profile of the drug is what uh, uh, that therapy rep represents to people. 
and, and during this time, too, in addition to uh, last few years uh, having less access to capital, there's also an increased regulatory burden that makes it more expensive, more difficult to navigate the various regulatory process to get a uh, product on the market. And so, uh, again, for a company like Gilead, we're profitable now. We can invest in some of the smaller companies that are struggling and it allows us to bring in additional technology. But we are concerned long term about smaller companies not having access to capital. And I know that's something National Academy works on, and I'm in various trade organizations working on that. So I do have one slide. Let's see if it comes up. There it is. It's called chemical structures, but I, it's not that complicated. And what I want to talk about on this slide is the evolution of our HIV product that transformed the therapy of AIDS. Um, Historically, AIDS patients, uh, AIDS was a death sentence until 1996, or only 14 years ago. 14 years ago, there were, there for, for the first time, were enough drugs that patients could be treated with three different agents to fully control the virus. If they're treated with one or two, the virus mutates and the drugs fail, and uh, then the disease progresses. So we needed multiple class and multiple drugs, and. Uh, 1996 was the beginning of it, but the drugs were very difficult to take and people would not take their full regimen and still develop resistance. So the product on the left is our drug Viriad that was launched in 2001, and it's a pro-drug. In the body it's degraded to tenofovir, which as you, for those of you who are chemically minded is a phosphonate. And these phosphonates are very polar, they are poorly absorbed uh, from the stomach to the bloodstream, and also are poor getting into cells. Viruses are essentially a little bag of DNA, right? And they get into a cell and they enzymatically replicate their DNA. And so what drugs like tenofovir do is block that DNA synthesis by inhibiting the polymerase. But it has to get in the cell, it has to stay in the cell. The polar molecule, the phosphonate like tenofovir, gets in the cell very little, but it gets out slowly. Well, when we're des designing a probe drug to allow for oral absorption so tenofovir could be, or Tenofovir DF could go back to tenofovir in the bloodstream. The, uh, we also wanted to target the lymphocytes that the HIV virus replicates in. So we in, basically this prodrug is engineered to be just stable enough in the bloodstream to make it to the lymphocytes, go into the cells, and be degraded to the parent compound, tenofovir. And as mass balance works, as soon as the prodrug is degraded inside the cell, you have a concentration gradient. So we have found that uh, we load up uh, the cells about tenfold of where they'd be if we weren't using a pro-drug. And that's uh, part of the key invention here. Tenofovir is a very good inhibitor, but it's not even orally absorbed, so it can't be a drug. By uh, making this pro-drug, having it orally absorbed and targeting cells, we're able to lower the dose and improve the therapeutic index. So we have a dose of, of Tenofovir DF that's non-toxic and it has a very good therapeutic index and given once a day. And it basically, as a result of that, was able to take over the market. Another thing about it, the lower dose means it's easier to combine in a combination pill. We had another, we have another HIV product that we launched in 2003 called intricytabine, and we combined the two of those together into one pill. Then we worked with Bristol-Myers and Merck because they had another drug, a third pill, that we could combine with R2 and still just have one pill but now containing all three drugs an agent need, a patient needs to take. And the evolution of the field to allow that also relied on the ability to do personalized medicine and have a careful uh, diagnostic capability to determine what type of virus is in, in the individual patient. So patients actually have the virus in their body genetically sequenced to look for the mutations that might confer resistance to individual drugs. And the three drugs we use in combination is, is a very good combination to overcome resistance and be good for most patients. And the other important thing, by having all three drugs in a single pill, the uh, patient has to take all or none. They can't take part of a regimen and get resistance. So the, the low, having the low dose allowed for it to be combined into uh, a single pill. Another thing about the low dose is reflected in low cost. Uh, therapy of HIV has led the way in terms of access. And so what is typically done is tiered pricing exists where uh, they, in 
the, most of the return on the investment for the innovation occurs in the developed world. Middle-income countries pay a significant discount, and the developing world is typically nonprofit. So uh, it's the cost of goods and distribution and small profit margin written in, and we've done that with Indian generic partners who are good at really pushing down the cost. The fellow that runs this program, Gilead, is an engineer, and so he really understands logistics and costs and how to work with manufacturing plants around the world. And as a consequence, um, he brought this drug three years ago from only 30,000 people in the developing world to 900,000 today. And the key was is to drive the cost down because uh, in the developing world, it's not the best bargain isn't necessarily the best drug. It's really the best cost so the most number of people can have access. There's uh, another area we're working in now. It's really the holy grail of infectious diseases is hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is a virus that infects the liver and replicates. And over a period of decades, it's a silent killer. People all of a sudden have liver failure without ever knowing they were infected. There's a very onerous therapy now that has lots of side effects and uh, doesn't cure everyone who takes it. And it only works for a, uh, a certain subclass of the virus. So what we and others are working on is coming up again with oral combination regimens that could suppress the virus. And in this case, if you suppress it, could lead to a cure after the course of a few months. But one of the challenges there will be with uh, several hundred million people in, around the world, especially in the developing world infected, is again to uh, make sure in the design of drugs and in the manufacturing process that, they're, they're, that the manufacturing can be cost effective and driven down to a very low price for the broad distribution in the developing world. And that's a very big engineering challenge for some of the complexities of these molecules. Uh, also in the future, we're going to see the type of structural stuff I have on this side being more and more expanded to larger biomolecules. Uh, we heard some comments about that this morning, about trying to uniform manufacturing standards and procedures to bring down the cost of these large molecules. And as um, more and more of these products become available and the healthcare systems in other parts of the world improve, it's going to be critical that uh, we continue to improve our manufacturing technology for these very large biomolecules. Another area of the future is stem cell research. You heard a lot about it now. Um, the, uh, uh, just to Miles' comments about the politics, uh, the politics of stem cell research is very confusing and complicated. And as a result, a lot of that has actually gone on in other parts of the world. And perhaps many of the innovations be in other parts of the world, but a lot of work's being done in the United States to uh, try to get through the regulatory and ethical issues to build a consensus on having very strong stem cell research programs here too. So with that, uh, I will call out the rest of my panel members and uh, invite them to the stage. Uh, first, uh, Peter Damiandis, uh, Diamandis, who is the founder and chairman of the XPRIZE Foundation. Mark Humayan, who's professor of biomedical engineering and ophthalmology here at USC. Jeff Wilcox, Corporate Vice President, Engineering, Lockheed Martin Corporation, and Paul Dabavik, Associate Director, Institute of Creative Technologies, again, here at UC. I believe uh, we'll go in order, and Peter will make the next comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So, good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to do my daring technique of not using PowerPoints, which is what I usually do. Uh, my own passion has been in grand challenges. And I fundamentally believe that any problem we have can be solved. So I got my start as a kid growing up during the Apollo era, absolutely passionate about going into space. And then along the way, figured out my chances were one in a thousand at best at becoming an Apollo astronaut. Uh, somewhere around the middle of college, made a commitment to myself that I was going to try and do it privately. And that led to a long series of events that eventually ended up in the XPRIZE. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But that's what's been driving me. And what I find is that we are living in an extraordinarily magical time right now. These next 30 or 40 years are a period of time that in all human history 
Uh, it will be significant as one could never believe thousands of years from now, tens of thousands of years from now. People will look back at these next few decades as the moment in time where the human race moved irreversibly off the planet permanently. You know, they've only done that once before when we moved out of the oceans onto land. The other thing that's going on right now that's amazing is that we have a huge amount of wealth concentrated in the hands of single individuals, probably about 2,000 billionaires on the planet, who have the ability to strike a choke, uh, st uh, stroke a check, <laughs> to, uh, to make things happen in their world. At the same time that that concentrated wealth exists, something else magical is happening that exponential technologies are putting into the hands of individuals, small groups, any of you here in the audience, capabilities that were only possible for large governments or large corporations before. You know, if you stop and you think about the fact that a Magi warrior in the middle of Africa today on a smartphone has better telecom capability than the President of the United States did 25 years ago. That same person, if they're sitting on Google, has access to more knowledge than the President of the United States had 20 years ago. That same technology trend is going to continue and change the world in a fundamental fashion. The Ansari X Prize, which my organization ran, a $10 million prize for the first private space flight, was effectively built by a group of 25 people, probably average age around 30, in the middle of the Mojave Desert, that did what, you know, and exceeded what the X-15 did some 40 years earlier earlier, which cost about one and a half billion dollars in 2004 year dollars and flew only one person compared to the capacity for flying three people. So what's happening today is that really the technology is coming down and it's about focusing the attention and the intention of individuals to solve these problems. So I spend a lot of time in the XPRIZE Foundation identifying what are the world's biggest problems that we need to solve and ultimately convincing people and creating the attitude that those problems can be solved. Because attitude is the first critical step in making any change happen. You have to believe it can be changed, it can be solved, and if you can, then it's about focusing the smartest people on the planet on driving that innovation. So the XPRIZE uh, Foundation, we currently have uh, just presented the Progressive Insurance Automotive XPRIZE for 100 mile per gallon equivalent cars. We had 136 vehicles from around the world who competed. The top three vehicles were awarded two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., ranging from 102 miles per gallon equivalent to 187. These are pre-production cars that are affordable, safe, fast, and get over 100 MPGE. Along the way, we created something called a miles per gallon equivalent metric. Uh, so that you can compare electric against hybrid against any type of fuel. Uh, in addition to the progressive competition, uh, we have the Google Lunar X Prize. And this is really a challenge to say, uh, you know, it is possible for a small group to do what only nations could have done before. So Google has put up $30 million, and all you have to do to win this is build a robot and land it on the surface of the moon. <laughs> Send back photos and videos, rove a half a kilometer and send back more photos and videos. Now we have 24 teams from around the world, a number of them affiliated with universities. Uh, I don't know that we have any USC teams yet, but I assume after this you can still register for the competition. Uh, and it's such an important competition, it's really to change the economics of going to the moon, where the cost of sending a rover to the lunar surface, uh, hopefully uh, after this, will be on the order of 30 to 50 million dollars. NASA uh, just recently announced they're putting up $30 million in contract money to match the $30 million in prize money. And at the end of the competition, they may be one of the biggest beneficiaries. If you can literally once a year or 10 times a year send a probe to different places and bring back data. In addition to that, we have the Archon X Prize for Genomics, sequence 100 human genomes in 10 days. We just recently announced the Wendy Schmidt Oil Cleanup X Challenge. Uh, Wendy Schmidt, Eric Schmidt, uh, X Schmidt's wife, who's the CEO of Google, has put up a, uh, one and a half million in prize money to reinvent how we clean up the oceans. So where we're looking for, we're looking for great prizable challenges. The notion is where can we incentivize small dynamic groups to go and solve problems that would change the world forever. We're looking at something called the AI Physician and the Tricorder. 
idea of using artificial intelligence to diagnose patients on a cell phone as good as any board-certified doctors, or a tricorder that you can cough onto or take a thumb prick and have a full lab diagnostics. These are microfluidic lab-on-a-chip technologies. Looking at bionics, looking at some education X prizes and global development. It's really something for me. It's can we set those clear, measurable, objective goals and incentivize the world, the smartest people in the world, to go and solve them? So that's the X prize. The other area that I get a lot of my passion in is a new university I had the honor to start with a friend, Ray Kurzweil, uh, something called Singularity University. Uh, that uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, Ray, who's really a, a visionary and a spokesperson for exponential technologies, I had had the pleasure of starting a university 20 years earlier called the International Space University. What we did in Silicon Valley, and it's a program that takes place during the summer for 10 weeks, so it's a complementary program to the USC's and the Caltech's and, and, uh, and MIT's of the world, where we attract uh, 80 grad students from around the planet. We had 1,600 applications for, from 35, um, and, uh, for 80 slots from 35 countries this past summer. And during this 10 weeks, what we say to you is during the first week, what are the world's biggest problems? What has been tried? What has failed? What do people wish they had to solve those big problems? The next four weeks during this program, you study all of the exponentially growing technologies, AI and robotics, Biotech, bioinformatics, nanomaterials, MEMS, nanotech, uh, computers, computational systems, networks, sensors, uh, human machine interface, neuro, uh, neurosystems, brain computer interface, and so forth. All of the fields that are based on Moore's law and are growing exponentially. And the notion is what's in the lab today? What's coming to market in 5, 10, and 20 years? And then, given that exponential growth curve of those technologies, how do you bundle them together to solve the world's biggest problems? The last five weeks, the students organize to work on what I call 10 to the 9th plus problems. Start a company or an organization that can affect a billion people positively in a decade. That's their metric of success. So we've been able to pull in uh, Google and Kaufman and Nokia and um, uh, Autodesk, a number of companies where we bring the faculty in from and focus them on those grand challenges. So I want to wrap in this last minute and 30 seconds because I promised... Uh, uh, promised Miles that I would end at the 10-minute mark, on the final notion, which is any breakthrough idea, any radical idea, the day before it's a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. And I want to I focus that one moment, because if it was not a crazy idea the day before, it wouldn't be a breakthrough. It'd be an incremental improvement. And the challenge we have is that in this nation, in the way we're structured right now, we have stopped taking the inherent risk required in breakthrough ideas in a lot of places. You have to be willing to take huge risks and a willingness to fail. So where in large corporations and where in government agencies do we encourage failure? One of my friends, Ratan Tata, who had the honor of being on our XPRIZE board, gives out a prize every year in Tata Industries for the best failures. The failures that actually learned and created uh, a new way of thinking. So, you know, we've become so risk adverse in this nation that it is literally killing our abilities to rapidly innovate. In 1961, when we went to the moon and JFK said we're going to go, we had no idea. Okay, I'm going to go 15 seconds late. We had no idea uh, how we were going to get there. But the challenge was so bold that it attracted the right people. And the average age of the engineers who built it and made it all happen, the rendezvous, the navigation, the guidance, and so forth, were in their late 20s. Because there was no one there to tell them how it could not be done. So next time someone who's in the mid-20s comes to you with a radical idea, listen. Thank you very much. Okay, well, good afternoon. I'm Mark Humayan, and I'd like to start off by thanking Dean Yorsos of the NAE for inviting me to speak with you. Um, as my slides come up here, uh, I'll be speaking to you about bioengineering research and its impact on and health and the joy of living. I'm a biomedical engineer and an ophthalmologist, so I see patients um, 
all the time uh, that for whom we have no curable solutions, no foreseeable solutions. In fact, my grandmother went blind and prompted me to get these two degrees, which uh, obviously take uh, quite a long time. Um, so if, if you look at modern technologies, and we've had wonderful lectures to date, uh, one has to think of them at least, uh, it makes it easy for me to think of them in these three categories. Preventative, of course, is the best. Uh, then the therapeutic, and if you can't help uh, treat the disease, then at least uh, it should be palliative. And each one of these uh, conditions has some very important aspects of it. For example, if it's therapeutic, you want it to be minimally invasive and least disruptive to the patient and family lifestyle. If it's preventative, it has to be early. It has to have early diagnostics. But if I'm to treat someone with very early on in their condition, the treatment has to be obviously very safe uh, and effective. So. If you look at some of the things we've already heard today uh, in terms of drug delivery, uh, dr drug discovery, a huge aspect of one of the grand challenges, uh, they, have to be they have to be safe for use chronically, especially if we're going to use this in this prophylactic manner. Uh, somebody who's 45 who's taking statins for high cholesterol for 30, 40 years, for example. New devices, uh, it's really exciting to be in an era where uh, PDAs, your phones, etc., are so wearable, so small. Uh, they're energy efficient, uh, so these wearable, portable, and implantable devices can really change the way we're doing things. And then, of course, accessible patient records. It's uh, ex extremely frustrating to not know what a cardiologist has done on a patient that you're seeing and so forth. Uh, and, of course, these records have to be secure um, and sensitive to the patient's uh, needs and, and privacy. Um, also, new modalities of screening. So if we're going to develop uh, prophylactic treatments, uh, whether it's through genetic, structural, or functional imaging, and I'll, I'll touch on some of these in my talk in just a minute. So as you've heard before, this is truly an interdisciplinary convergence. Uh, Max Nikias mentioned this earlier on. Uh, it is not something that is done very, very readily uh, if you're just sitting uh, in your own silo on your, on your own discipline. And in our center here at uh, the Biomimetic Microelectronic Systems, or BMES and SF Center. In fact, we have, we've been privileged and uh, have succeeded by creating uh, this sort of uh, an environment. You can see we collaborate with universities, Department of Energy laboratories, as well as industry uh, that spans the country. And because of this, we have been fortunate enough to actually have 60 medical devices that are out there in use in one way or shape or form. And again, industry collaboration and support is integral to this to allow that transition from university and get it from bench side to the patient. So the areas of innovation that are going to be critical are implant technology, instrumentation, diagnostics, and novel therapies. And these are some pictures from some of the technologies we're developing in our engineering research center. And if they're, for example, we already talked a little bit about preventative and how that needs to play a role, and as an ophthalmologist, let me share a particular uh, set of numbers with you which shows the prevalence of macular degeneration, cataract, diabetic retinopathy, uh, and really causing uh, blindness uh, in all sorts of um, ethnic uh, and racial backgrounds. And in fact, the problem is uh, quite substantial, as you can see by these numbers in the millions easily in the United States alone. So what have we done? We went to Jet Propulsion Laboratory and fortunately saw this little camera that was used to look at jet fuel from rockets and how well the jet fuel was being used. So everybody was focused on getting to Mars and making sure the fuel was being utilized properly. But it dawned on us that, look, it's a way to capture 30 to 50 spectral bands in less than three milliseconds. So how could we use that? Well, you can take this and actually turn it and look inside the eye. Before the eye moves in less than three milliseconds, you can capture these bands and actually learn about the oxygen content of the retina. You can learn about uh, macular degeneration and the pharmacological changes the, uh, it, into the eye. And so minimally invasively putting it on a camera, you can see, and this is a patient of mine who has a stroke, uh, occlusion in the eye, you can see the blood uh, um, in, in the top part of the picture. But in any event, using this camera, we were able to tell that this tissue is being perfused with good oxygen. So we didn't have to laser and destroy it. We could actually rejuvenate it with some injections in the eye. What about therapeutically? What can we do there 
Uh, again, uh, cost-effective treatments, you've heard that over and over uh, today, but one of the technologies we've developed is the artificial retina, and this is a large consortium. Um, uh, we started, we did the first implant here at USC, but involves Second Sight Medical Products, Department of Energy Labs, and a very large effort in an international trial where we're putting a computer chip in and around your eye to restore sight. So basically, it captures images from the camera, sends it in real time, and stimulates um, the retina in allowing a blind person to see. And imagine what this can do. A wearable, implantable device can certainly uh, have medical records on it, for an example. Uh, it can do a lot of things. And earlier you saw in the day a little contact lens that could provide some guidance of the environments you're in. But as we get into these portable, small, implantable, or wearable devices, they open up a whole new genre of areas that I think are very exciting. So um, you can see here in a video, uh, if we have the audio here, this is, a, this is the, the, one of the first five patients implanted. Um, the more fruit that any ball goes in is amazing. She's totally blind. We can turn it up. The circle in her glasses is a camera, and some clever electronics turns the images into patterns of dark and light. It may not sound like much, but for Linda, it's made a huge difference. So this, this lady had been blind for 30 years, and with one of the earlier implants, it shows you that even though this device is red, uh, very rudimentary compared to what you and I see, it's the ability of the human brain to take advantage and use these devices and allow uh, this grandmother uh, to play with her grandson um, in a meaningful manner, in an enjoyable manner. Again, that a concept of enjoying life. So where, where obviously we need to go here is there are a number of incredible challenges here um, to reduce power, uh, reduce size, lower the power requirements, increase the functionality. And in fact, you can see uh, the one picture with the big sort of device is a handmade device. And for us to get to the next level, these devices have to be microfabricated. So what are some of the challenges that, uh, you know, at least I see in our group sees? Um, there clearly need to be power supply issues. Matt Terrell mentioned this earlier in terms of, uh, you know, one of the issues that's, that spans across these challenges. Hermetic packaging, meaning packaging where you can submerse electronics in a wet environment and yet these electronics survive. Uh, gene therapy is an important area that uh, obviously has a lot of promise as well as stem cell research. And in terms of long research, long term research and development paths, I mean, these if you take a drug, and we just heard uh, Dr. Martin talk about it, I mean, this is a very arduous process. You know, you often start with something, and despite the best of simulations and preclinical testing, these drugs don't make it. A lot of them don't make it. How can we improve these simulations, make them better, so these drugs have a higher success? And, of course, the long regulatory path. Uh, if I'm going to put a computer chip in your eye, you could imagine the types of uh, long uh, regulatory paths that we have to go through. Uh, to show the safety of these devices, and, and therefore these trials are very costly. So we're going to bring a lot of this technology to the forefront. We have to at least consider these sorts of challenges. Now, on the educational side, uh, there are equally great challenges. Um, the students in the audience and the students listening in, uh, you know, we have to be able to recruit and educate the workforce of the future. Uh, we have to educate our patients and patients' families as to what is available and provide real hope and develop this real interdisciplinary curricula here. We're lucky as part of the center uh, with my colleagues Michael Koo, Ted Berger, and Jim Weiland. We were able to, and many others, develop a course in neural engineering which focuses on, on the types of uh, uh, backgrounds that you need to be able to take a microelectronic device and put it into the body. Funding of these interdisciplinary uh, researches, uh, obviously through government, interagency projects are important. I've often found something very intriguing in the Department of Energy, but how do you develop that and do a clinical trial with the NIH, National Institutes of Health? How do we make that much easier? And of course, industry is critical, as I pointed out. Can we get them to be more interested, take greater risks, and be involved with acad academia earlier on? And lastly, of course, philanthropic efforts. Uh, there are many of them out there, and you heard about the X Prize, uh, the, the impact they can make. So thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, exciting to be here and on this uh, innovation panel, this august panel. I was sitting backstage 
chatting with these folks, wondering how did I ever get on such an august panel? And then I remembered, oh yeah, I wrote a check. That's right. Um, there are many paths to the top. So students, write that down, for you, you, you USC students. Um, also struck me, I'm the only one here not named after a founding member of the Beatles, I think. So, um, <laughs> Uh, let's see, I was asked to, to talk to um, uh, vulnerability and sustainability. That was the topic that I was given. Uh, and what I want to do is sort of walk you through that with five of my ten minutes and talk about how I see that and then pivot on to innovation and talk about innovation from a very specific um, perspective. Uh, so I'll apologize in advance for the nuts and bolts approach. Miles challenged us at the start to say, okay, what are we actually going to do? Okay, how are we going to meet these grand challenges? And I want to get at that a little bit with my time. The first thing I want to do is posit that vulnerability and sustainability are really part of the same category, which is security. It's really about global security. Uh, clearly, the vulnerability grant challenges, they're obvious in, in terms of uh, being about security. Sustainability may be less so, um, but fundamentally, anything that threatens a citizen's access to the basic uh, necessities of life is, uh, can cause conflict and ends up being about security. So as Chuck talked about this morning, uh, you know, access to clean water becomes a security issue. Just look at the conflicts that are taking place across the globe because of it. Uh, energy and climate change, uh, which is also causing security uh, issues as, uh, as those effects start to manifest themselves. And I want to draw that connection because if you tie them both together and call it security, then you can start to think about it from the perspective of, of how do you address them and who's going to address them. Because fundamentally, I would suggest that government's first responsibility is to provide for the security of its citizens. And so at the end of the day, while these all require academia, industry, government, dot, 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 uh, these are fundamentally government's responsibilities to set the regulatory environment and set the policy and to a large extent, you know, provide the funding for how we're going to go after those. Uh, that matters. Why am I walking you down this path? Because governments don't have a whole lot of money uh, anymore. A and so we're flying in the teeth as we try to meet these grand challenges when it comes to security uh, of a really challenging uh, world economic environment. And that's different than, I think, the, the challenges of the last century that we faced and met. When we were waging wars that were fundamentally uh, existential in nature, uh, we wanted to put a man on the moon, we wanted to build the interstate highway system, uh, all expensive propositions at a time when we had the money to do it. Now we're trying to meet these challenges at a time when it's not obvious where that money is going to come from. Uh, and so what I want to suggest is the ultimate grand challenge behind these grand challenges is the grand challenge of affordability. So when you think about uh, innovation, I want to talk about innovation from the perspective of how do you innovate for affordability. Um, there's sort of uh, innovation in a consumer space. Uh, first of all, it's hard for me because I've, uh, I give lots of talks and I don't think I've ever said innovation from the stage because I don't like the word uh, because it's imprecise to me and so I don't like the, the word that I can't define and then act on. Um, but Innovation in a consumer space is typically about solving what one writer called the value puzzle. There's a market out there, you just don't know it or they don't know it, and if you can put the pieces together, you'll, you'll realize that market. So I saw the Facebook movie last weekend. You know, people didn't know they had that need, but once it was available, they did, and you put the pieces together. No real new technologies, and, and you have a huge market. Uh, same thing for iPod, of course. I, nobody really knew that if only I could pay 99 cents for a song and control my own music, that would create this huge market, but it did. Uh, that's the consumer space. The government space is, uh, is subtly different in that if you think about the government as a customer or provider of resources, they tend to tell you what they want. They say, we have these challenges, and uh, because we have these challenges, you propose solutions. And then when you're in a climate where there's not a lot of money, ultimately that becomes about who's, who can provide those solutions affordably. Because these grand challenges cannot be met unless we tackle the issue of how we're going to pay for them. Uh, and so what I want to talk about with respect to uh, innovation uh, is affordability specifically. Uh, and I want to talk about um, four different things that I'll suggest as paths forward to achieving affordability uh, and innovation when it comes to responding to these security uh, grand challenges. And I'm going to take the liberty, sponsor's liberty, of casting them all uh, with some Lockheed Martin examples. Uh, I'll argue that uh, Kelly Johnson, who worked just a few miles from here in Burbank and founded the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, now up in Palmdale, uh, was not only the greatest, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, system engineer uh, of the last century, but also one of the greatest innovators. If you look at the aircraft 
that came out of the Skunk Works, uh, the F-117, the U-2, the SR-71, incredibly innovative aircraft for their time. They still look incredibly futuristic. When you go look at those at the Air and Space Museum back in Washington, you think this is, looks like it's from 100 years in the future now. Uh, incredibly innovative. And Kelly Johnson spent a lot of time articulating for his team what his rules were. And you can find them on, 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 on the internet. And he would post these rules uh, all over the workspace. Uh, and they informed how they brought innovation to bear to meet those challenges affordably. Uh, and so I'll suggest four to you with my four minutes left. Uh, and the first, I'll rephrase somewhat, is don't introduce unnecessary complexity striving for performance. This is something all of us engineers have a really hard time with because, you know, we went to school and we know how to do it and we love to get that last dB of performance out of our systems. We just can't help ourselves. Um, but the problem is when you do that, uh, one of Norm Augustine's laws is, and I'll butcher it a little bit, but basically one-third of your cost and two-thirds of your problems come from getting that last 10% of performance. Uh, if we're going to meet these grand challenges affordably, we've got to move out of a, a mental space which is all about performance and into one which is about achieving uh, mission success without striving for that last 10% um, of performance. So what does that mean in terms of running an engineering company? You know, one of the things we work at hard uh, is making sure that our engineers um, are, have uh, reference architectures that they can work with where they start with things that work, with architectures that work. You know, we love to use the latest chip, we love to use the latest uh, development environment and tools and whatnot, uh, but introducing unnecessary complexity introduces cost, uh, and that is a, a, an affordability uh, issue. Second, which is related but a little bit distinct, is start with what works. And I'll go back to the, the Skunk Works example. Uh, when they were given a challenge, like build an airplane that flies higher than any airplane has ever flown before, the first thing that Kelly Johnson and his team did was not say, okay, everybody to the drawing board. The first thing they did was look around and say, what do we got? What can we work with? Uh, and if you read Ben Rich's Skunk Works history, it talks about what he did was he had an old F-104 demonstrator. He kind of cut it in half and put longer wings on it. And so if you look at the U-2 and the F-104 side by side, the nose is pretty much the same. Uh, it worked just fine. There was no need to introduce you know, new, uh, new technologies at that point. Uh, the F-117 similarly looks very advanced, uh, but uh, the landing gear, I think, is an F-15. The uh, engines are an F-18. The, the mission systems are from B-52s. Uh, so start with what works. That uh, will get you on a track <laughs> to innovating for affordability. <clears throat> uh, third, uh, and this is something engineers have a hard time with, we're not great communicators, we're not great storytellers. We like to be in our cubicle, we like to work uh, kind of all by ourselves pretty much or in teams with other engineers, but it's not the best way to solve problems. Uh, and everybody says when it comes to innovation, think out of the box. It's an easy thing to say. Norm Augustine likes to say the best way to think out of the box is to talk to someone that's not in the box. Uh, and uh, he, he gives a great example. Some of you may know this. I'm sure Miles knows this. But uh, the first dozen or so space shuttles that went up, Lockheed Martin makes the external tank for the space shuttle, were white, which all space hardware is white, if you think about it. Of course, since then, they've all been this bright orange. And I always grew up thinking, why did they paint it that hideous color? Uh, and the story behind why it's orange is... Uh, they were challenged to find 8,000 more pounds to get payload into orbit. And what they did was got the first 7,200 pretty easily, I'll say, um, but the last 10% was the hard part, right? Uh, and so the engineers, as Norm tells the story, are all in a conference room and they're redesigning rivets, doing the stuff that we know how to do, trying to get that last 800 pounds out. Uh, and somebody from the factory wandered by, more or less, and basically said, well, why don't you just not paint it? And they said, well, because... All space hardware is white. Of course we're going to paint it white. And then somebody said, wait a minute, how much is the paint weigh? Well, the paint weighs 800 pounds. <laughs> and that's why you see the original metal when you look at the external tank, which is orange. Um, that's innovation, I'll posit. It's innovation, but it's not about new technology. Uh, it's about talking to other people, getting outside your own box, getting yourself in a different uh, frame of reference. Uh, and then finally, uh, what's always struck me as... Um, amazing is what our users, who in many cases, most cases for Lockheed Martin are uh, men and women uh, in the service, uh, often in harm's way, will take systems and use them in ways they were not designed to be used in order to get the mission done. At the most innovative people you'll ever come across are the people in the field whose lives and whose friends' lives depend on figuring out innovation. Uh, and I suspect if you want to do a good study of how to innovate, the military academies are probably a good place to, to look. Uh, for example, at the start of the Afghan conflict, they took the Kitty Hawk aircraft carrier and stripped off its air wing and replaced it with special operations uh, units. Never meant to do that, um, but, but the value of that aircraft carrier 
with the aircraft on it was low, the value with the special ops on it was high. Uh, and similarly, all of a sudden you had guys on camels calling in, you know, precision strikes from legacy B-52s. There was never a plan, I'm sure, before the, wall, the war that said, find a camel, uh, call up the B-52. You know, they innovated, they did all that kind of uh, in real time. What does that mean to engineers? We shouldn't have to make them work hard to do that, the people that are using our systems. Uh, and so design for flexibility uh, is absolutely a critical uh, component for enabling user innovation, uh, which is often the most effective form of innovation. Because at the end of the day, and I'll steal one of Miles's quotes here that he gave last week, uh, it's not about the stuff, it's about the people, right? At the end of the day, it's about the people who we're going to empower through this innovation and this, uh, this engineering approach. So, thanks. Right. Well, it's an absolute thrill to be here. My name is Paul DeBevick, and I work at the University of Southern California, which is very near here. Um, actually, over in uh, Playa Vista at the Institute for Creative Technologies. And uh, basically, uh, I am uh, part of the Computer Graphics Research Group, and our institute is all about trying to innovate to try to create the next generation of virtual reality. And uh, we think of all of the different uh, exciting kinds of applications uh, that we'll have for that. Uh, it was very uh, exciting to be part of this because, as it turns out, uh, enhancing virtual reality uh, has been identified as one of the 14 grand challenges by the National Academy of uh, Engineering. I was on their website and I read about all the exciting possibilities that it will have for uh, uh, teaching instruction with like virtual characters, uh, immersing people in digital environments that look completely real and, and, and 3D, uh, and uh, training them for their jobs, and obviously entertainment uh, applications. And there's even uh, something on the website here where, where there's a, uh, a button you can click on. You can even vote for your favorite uh, grand challenge. So I, of course, voted for uh, virtual reality. Uh, and th then it showed me kind of where that ranked on the 14 grand challenges with other people's votes. I wasn't expecting that. It was kind of down here. It was number uh, 13 uh, out of uh, 14. So I was a little crestfallen about that, um, <laughs> actually. Uh, but then I looked at what number 14 was, and that's down here, and it said manage the nitrogen cycle. Uh, so I did a little bit of reading up on the nitrogen cycle, and it turns out that's really important. So um, <laughs> then I was thinking, okay, this is really awesome. Okay, great. Um, so um, one of the biggest challenges that we've been working on um, and, um, at our institute is kind of the idea of trying to create photoreal digital uh, humans, and it's been a really exciting decade to try to work on creating photoreal digital humans uh, because um, there's uh, just been so much progress uh, from back when 12 years ago, I remember we could have conversations with other people in academia and the visual effects industry, and, and it was really a question mark as to whether basically this grand challenge for our, our, our own field would ever be met. Is there any way we could ever render in computer graphics something that people would mistake uh, for a moment as being a, a realistic digital human? And there were a number of uh, uh, innovations along the last 10 years, some, some misfires and such. Uh, and my lab actually got to be a part of uh, creating some of the, uh, the characters. And to do the innovation, since we didn't really know where to start, we actually just went back to an engineering principle, which is let's treat the whole thing as a sparse data interpolation problem. Um, a virtual actor is some kind of digital data set of a person that needs to be rendered from any viewpoint, seen in any illumination, so you can do cinematography on it, and then animated or directed to create any performance. Uh, and we want to look as real as possible. So we actually started uh, building devices to just capture, you know, real humans, like Actual people look photoreal, right? So let's sample them uh, as little data points. Let's build devices that let us light people from different directions, put cameras around, view them from different directions, uh, make it so that in just 15 photographs with different polarization conditions and lighting directions, we can capture the 3D shape of their face down to skin pores and, and all of the surface maps of the diffuse color and the, the specular shine off of the skin. So we can do that in about three seconds, and then we can capture all uh, across the space of different expressions of human faces. And if we take all of this data and find a way, now that computers are so much faster, it can store uh, all of the uh, geometry and reflectance information of interpolating 
translating between that, we might be able to create a photoreal digital human. And we were very lucky to work with a company called Image Metrics, which is part of the visual effects industry uh, here in Los Angeles, to take this data set of this woman named Emily O'Brien, she's an actress, uh, and try to create a photoreal digital version of her just by interpolating between her different expressions, uh, matching the lighting, matching the viewpoint from our data sets, and then driving her according to video, which is the way that uh, their process works. And this is the result that Image we got. Matrix is a markerless performance-driven animation company. We specialize in high-quality facial animation for video games and films. And those are basically, that was a photoreal digital face. This is the diffuse component of the skin. If you look at the specular component of the skin, it looks a little funny all on its own, but we're rendering that. Uh, this is the underlying wireframe here. And if you take it all the way to the original video of Emily before we replaced her uh, face, it looks very similar. And most people, when they look at that, even though we got that result two years ago, um, are, are, are happy to believe that that's, that, that that's a, a, a human face, including Emily O'Brien herself, who assumed, like many people, it was just video of, uh, of her. So that was really nice to be uh, a, a part of uh, achieving a piece of that vision. And we've also gotten... Uh, to even further inspire the innovation by directly working with the motion picture industry. We helped capture a number of actors for James Cameron's movie Avatar um, so that uh, the, uh, the Na'vi creatures could have some of the same uh, skin pore structure and facial shape of the actors that were driving them. And uh, in the latest project, which actually isn't quite out yet, but I'll show you a couple images from the uh, trailer, we got to work with Digital Domain, applying our light stage technologies with many other amazing technologies and their own artistry and tons of work that they did. Our, our part is quite small on this, but we got to uh, help give them some of the data they needed. Uh, it's allowing them to create a version of the actor Jeff Bridges. You can see him as he looks today on the left the way that he looked in the original Tron movie in 1982. So he can play another character that's based on the way that he looked back then. And here's a little clip from that. So, and that's coming out in December. And again, that was really one of the biggest challenges that we had, just thinking about it 10 years ago. Could we actually create an actor the way that they used to look when they were young? Uh, I'm sure within the next five years, we'll see actors who are no longer with us starring in movies. Uh, again, let's hope they do that uh, very tastefully. So, so uh, working with industry, academic and industrial collaborations are a great way to inspire innovation, to solve problems that industry has because now these same technologies will eventually get in not just movies but also video games into educational training, into industrial training, into military training. Uh, all of the kinds of areas where photoreal characters in virtual environments can be uh, better used as realistic. And another way that um, we can have um, uh, the movies in some way inspire innovation is not by the technology they need but by the technology they depict. Science fiction is a great source of uninvented technologies that would be great if we only had them. And one of them we heard earlier in the uh, technology panel uh, is the idea of virtual telepresence, of, of basically telecommuting uh, somewhere so that if for some reason uh, you're, uh, you're Yoda uh, and you find yourself stuck on the Wookiee planet, you can still dial it into your Jedi Council, Council meeting. General Krieger, a partial message was intercepted in a diplomatic packet from the chairman of Utapa. Mm. Act on this, we must. Don't try using that as an excuse while you don't make your associate director's meeting, by the way. Quickly and decisively, we should proceed. Now, this is really a great depiction of the idea because, as you can see, Yoda can virtually turn around and actually make eye contact with Anakin Skywalker there and stare him down. Anakin knows that Yoda's looking at him. All the other Jedi don't think that Yoda's looking at them. He thinks he's looking at Anakin. This is very important for human interpersonal communication. It's something you definitely don't get in a Skype chat or an iChat at this point. Um, 
So we were wondering, well, how can we move a little bit toward this technology? There's a lot of magic uh, going on there. Uh, but one thing that got us a little bit of the way there was realizing that if we spin kind of the special mirror really fast and put very high-speed video on top of it running at thousands of frames per second, uh, we can actually build a three-dimensional display of sorts that doesn't require any 3D glasses and gets a three-dimensional image of a scene to all the people who might be uh, standing around it. And uh, when one of our sponsors saw this, they actually asked, seeing that head, could, could this be a virtual teleconference? Could we put a 3D face on there and actually interact with it? And so that got us inspired to think, uh, well, uh, what if we had like a live 3D scanning system? A person could sit here and see all the people who come up and talk to them, and we'd uh, have like a fast video projector uh, doing stripe patterns on their face so we can get their three-dimensional geometry, beam it over the uh, internet. It's not very much data. Uh, just to get a depth map and a texture map going over. And we made the mirror a bit larger on our display, and we got something where, in three dimensions, you can actually interact with a digital face. And these two fellows here, Andrew and Magnus, are talking to Jillian. They see Jillian in 3D. They're obviously not wearing special glasses. Uh, everyone else can see a 3D view of Jillian. As Jillian looks between Magnus and Andrew, they can each sense uh, who she's looking at. And that's something that adds quite a bit of a dimension to this kind of conversation. So I think that looking to the movies and looking to industrial collaborations, we can find a lot of inspiration uh, to try to innovate some of these uh, technologies. And uh, thank you very much. Those are my remarks. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. So, Paul, let me, let me just ask you, when, you uh, when you're hanging around actors, uh, are you worried about sabotage on your car or anything, you know, cutting the brake cables? Or they may soon be out of a job. All, all of the digital actors so, so far are driven by real actors. So there have so far not yet been any digital performances. There's just been digital uh, appearances. We're going to have a lot of innovation to do in artificial intelligence before the, performers, the performances themselves are being created digitally. But I guess conceivably you could make a completely virtual star, right? At some point that's going to happen quite soon. Yeah. A lot of people would be out of work. That's uh, any, it'd be interesting. All right, so uh, we, we got a lot of um, questions for all the panelists. So I'm going to go to those first, and we'll do some of the specific ones um, from tweets. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, I once heard that failure is only success uh, deferred. Uh, can these innovative speakers tell us how they learned from and conquered failure? And we'll just take it down the line. Go ahead, John. You want to start? Well, uh, we... we as I said earlier, the development of a, a drug product goes through many, many stages. And at the end, sometimes you have a drug product, sometimes you don't. It doesn't work out. But every step along the way, you face failure, and you have to have a combination of persistence and agility. Perceive to Persist to try to get the innovation done, but agility to be flexible enough to get around the barriers. Right. Any personal stories in your career where you, you well, met yeah, with failure? I, that, well, I talk, I, the molecule yeah. I showed uh, at the top right on that slide, tenofovir, the first drug in that series uh, looked very similar, but it had kidney toxicity. Yeah. And putting a, I didn't talk about it, but putting a methyl group on there changed it. And so we had a big setback as a company because of the kidney toxicity, but we were able to innovate around that through the structural chemistry and through the prodrug technology I talked about. All right, Peter, you got a big failure you learned from? Oh, I've got lots of great failures. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know part of the story. Back in 1996, when uh, we announced the first X Prize, uh, we had uh, the NASA administrator on stage, the FAA administrator, 20 astronauts on stage, and announcing this $10 million prize, and we had no money. Um, and it was, uh, we all suspected that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but you were very, you had that silver tongue going. It was, <laughs> it was born above the line of super credibility, as I call, given the people on stage with me. And um, none of the reporters actually asked, do you have the money or do you have any teams, which we didn't. Uh, I could kick myself for that, by yeah, the well, way. Yeah, <laughs> well, thank God you did. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, but it was, you know, I thought it'd be pretty easy to raise the capital. I mean, after all, you know, you pay after someone does it. You know, that's the big idea. You know, how simple is that? But so I probably pitched 150, 200 CEOs uh, from, you know, the heads of all the auto companies to Richard Branson and Fred Smith and so forth and failed and failed and failed and really uh, had to uh, learn from every one of those engagements what people didn't want to do and ultimately uh, 
uh, funded it through the Ansari X Prize, through a whole in one insurance policy. And uh, but at the end of the day, failure really is about rapid iteration and testing. We do it phenomenally well in the computer industry. We don't do it well in the aerospace or automotive or hardware industry where we're afraid to have invested so much time and money and lose it all. But I've, yes, I've learned plenty from failures. <laughs> Mark, you have a, a failure story to share? Well, uh, let me just share a perspective with you. I mean, I think the kind of things we're doing are extremely difficult and they take often many, many years. In my case, 20 years for this artificial retina. So well, I and learned, the consequences of failure when you're dealing with human beings and it, putting things inside their eyeballs is, yeah, I mean, is pretty serious, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's all high yeah. stakes. And, yeah. I, and the bottom line is that I've learned to enjoy the process. It's really not about the failure. Uh, it's about the road. It's the path you've taken. And if you can enjoy the process and take the lumps with the good times, uh, it works out. And, uh, and I've, I've had some of the best times sitting there knowing that all the engineering works and um, sitting there and your heart is just about stopped because when the first patient we implanted, it took about 20 minutes for the blind person to see because he hadn't seen for 50 years. So in the interim, you're sitting there 20 minutes checking every circuit, every electronic gadget. So I still vividly remember it, but they're all good times and I think it's just the process that uh, you have to enjoy. What's that moment like when somebody, after all those years, says, hey, I see something, Doc? Well, it, it's, as, you know, you and I have talked once before about this, but it's just one of the most exciting times uh, of my life. You, you just can't throw a switch on and make someone see. It just, you know, those kind of things just come once in a lifetime for me, so. Yeah, yeah. All right, Jeff, you got a failure story? Oh, yeah. Well, I love the question because I, I do think it's impossible to learn leadership skills without having failed. That's why I'm a little skeptical about uh, how you can teach leadership uh, in school. I think you have to go through these experiences. Uh, I talked about the Skunk Works earlier. A lot of crashes associated with those great aircraft and uh, a lot of uh, early satellites that failed to go off. My personal story, uh, my very first project management effort uh, was to oversee a program that was building this 90 foot long spar buoy, which is essentially a fiberglass, long fiberglass series of tubes, had some antennas on it, and we were about set to deploy it, uh, lifted it up by the forklift on one end, and it fell off and broke. And this was like a year, uh, two years of my life just in pieces on the ground. And I, I will never forget looking at it. Uh, and the lesson I took from it was I walked around it and walked around it and I was thinking, uh, and the question I asked myself, which is one I still come back to to this day, is what do I really need out of this experiment? You know, I talk about that extra 10% that causes the problem. It didn't really need to be 90 feet. Uh, so we took the 60 feet that was still intact, put the antennas on top of that, deployed it, and got our data. Uh, so that extra 10% will kill you. So. Paul, you got a story? Well, the earliest versions of our, of our light stage process to capture actors' faces um, really were very much based on trying to capture every single lighting condition, every single expression, every single viewpoint. So we had lots of cameras, lots of light. And if you multiply all those up together, you end up with uh, tens of gigabytes of data uh, for a face. And so we tried to do an animation just by blending between those. And it actually, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, it took us like two years to come up with three seconds of animation. Um, which was uh, not going to become a practical uh, technique. But because of just forcing ourselves to slog through that, um, just out of desperation, we had to innovate. We had to figure out what's a better way to do that. And even if doing it that way wasn't the right way at the beginning, now we have far fewer lighting conditions. We figured out models of how skin reflects light and actually use the real geometry of the face to do this. And we have something that's not only great for us to build research on, but it's actually a practical thing that industry can make use of as well. You look awfully real right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying my hardest. How did well they done. do that? It's that's amazing. amazing. <laughs> All right, a couple specifics that came up out of your talks. Uh, John, this one's for you. It comes from uh, Jeff Newman. How, how was Gilead able to bring the cost down so low to be able to distribute the drug for free to developing countries? Yeah, well, a actually, we didn't. Uh, the, uh, what we needed to do was create competition, so we uh, gave non-exclusive license to the Indian generic manufacturers. And we did not put any pricing restrictions on for what they could sell it for. So they can charge as much as, you know, the Marco Barrett's really like a consumer product. And then several companies compete. And to get their margins and to be able to compete and win tender offers from various countries and organizations, the only way to do it is drive the cost down. So it's the, the, the economic principle of that competition. And 
a lot of really good uh, engineers and chemists working on the process has brought the price down quite dramatically. Yeah, it makes me think about what Jeff was having to say. Jeff, there was one for you, too. How do you, how do you bridge the gap between academia and industry? And others can take this one as well, but I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, so bringing those ideas in is absolutely critical to innovation. Uh, and, uh, and I won't say it's not challenging, because there is something of an impedance mismatch, for those of you with uh, electrical engineering backgrounds, uh, between the communities. Um, but like any other mismatch, it can be dealt with through um, uh, communication and improving communication. So we put a lot of effort into traveling to the schools uh, and uh, talking to the students, talking to the faculty, both from a research perspective as well as from a curriculum shaping perspective, because we're very interested in uh, working with academia so that the students come out of academia you know, well tailored to the types of, uh, of needs that we have. Uh, another technique we have which works very well is to, uh, is to communicate very carefully. I was talking to someone from Duke about this yesterday, in fact what our strategic technologies are. Uh, what are those strategic technology threads? Why are they important to us? Where do we need to, where are the gaps? Where do we need to see improvements made? Uh, if you communicate that well and get that out and then have a series of dialogues on it, uh, then you can improve that mismatch quite effectively. Anybody else want to address yeah. the um, I, academia yeah. link? I, I'm, I'm yeah. extremely lucky that the field of computer graphics, the main conference for that is uh, the Association for Computing Machineries. Uh, Come SIGGRAPH. to busy, will you? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, the ACM SIGGRAPH uh, conference, which you know, uh, since the 1980s has really brought together academics and industrial practitioners and artists and, and, and commercializers all at the same conference, which is often in Los Angeles, usually in July or August. And I think there's a fundamental alignment between the movie industry and academic research of trying to show you something that you've never seen before. And so these kindred spirits working in different areas uh, just have a great way of coming together and having a natural inclination to work together on something. And all of the results that we've gotten in our laboratory that have been you know, the most interesting have been the result uh, wouldn't have been possible without industrial inspiration and collaboration. Mark, you, obviously, you have close ties to academia. You work at an academic institution. Right. Tell us a little no, bit about I, that. I echo, you know, we've uh, had a number of medical products out there um, that it's great to see being used in helping patients. So I think echoing what Jeff said is, uh, you know, to understand what the strategic vision is of, of the companies, uh, work with them, and, uh, you know, over the years, you can actually guide and steer them a bit as well. Uh, so it is really that close relationship and back and forth uh, that's required to make this happen. You just can't have an idea and really plop it on industry's desk. Uh, if it's a great idea, maybe it'll take off, but often it requires that, uh, that relationship beforehand to build it. So you don't see anything that needs fixing in this regard? That academia and business uh, is no, connected? I, uh, no, I, no I, I'm saying is there's a, yeah. there is a challenge there because yeah, it is. Uh, I would rather not you know, I'd rather be in the lab, work with my colleagues at, at the university and go to yeah. nice venues like this and lectures and, and not have to travel around the world and, and, and see our corporate members. Uh, so there, it's, a, it's a time constraint, uh, uh, but you have to make that effort and you have to, you know, go the extra yard to, to really meet them. Peter, this one's uh, specifically addressed to you, but others can get in on this too. Uh, how can we design systems that accept and value uh, failure uh, and, and for that matter, I suppose, prizes. Uh, prizes don't do that, right? They don't reward failure. How, how, do you, how, do you re how do you tangibly reward failure? So first of all, I mean, I, I believe that to, to create an innovation environment, you have to be tolerant of failure and tolerant of risk. And a lot of places are not uh, tolerant uh, of that. And, and to really innovate, it's, it's critical to set a goal and an objective without specifying how to get there. So uh, one of the challenges that we have in the government is uh, you want to achieve a certain goal and you end up not only telling them, uh, not telling you know, uh, how you need the subsystems built, your specifications are so specified and, and who you want to build it that a lot of times you never get there and the projects are canceled in the final result versus saying here's the goal, here's the objective, whoever does it wins and here's the money. So uh, I mentioned Ratan Tata, who actually uh, uh, gives a prize for failure. Um, it's a tough thing to do because you really uh, want to make sure that something is learned from that. Uh, you need to. Uh, uh, so one of the ways that we that you can do it is you know fail often, fail early. So if you want to come out with a new product, 
you go to uh, a bunch of teams and you say, listen, you have, each of you have five weeks and $5,000 to go and try five ideas out and really to try very rapid iteration. Uh, and with the notion that you're not going to get a final product, but you're going to at least have tested a whole bunch of different uh, arenas. So uh, John Carmack, who's one of the uh, you know, company, one of the individuals who's been building rocket-powered vehicles, typically came out of the software business. He created Quake and Doom and came into the rocket business. One of the things that he did was they get together on Tuesdays and Saturdays and they build rockets. And instead of designing something, they go to the lab and they literally build stuff. And if it works, then they write it down. Very, very much more to the early Skunk Works uh, approach of really building and trying, building and trying. I mean, you, you do that simulation a lot better, but it's the it rapid iteration. It's a, it's a model rocket club on steroids, isn't it? They just keep, they go out and have fun, don't they? All right, uh, what about um, when we look at the uh, educational system, there's a tweet from some somebody who's worried about their grades probably. How do we facilitate an environment in our educational system where failure is shown to have value? Um, <laughs> Clearly, a student sent that. All right, so who would like to take a whack at that one? Anybody? He <laughs> 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 uh, fails. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's I, I think it's about play, it's about experimentation, it's about following your intuition. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you can become successful at any industry, anything. And the most scarce thing is actually finding something you're passionate about and you love. And if you can find that thing, I think which all of us on the panel uh, and many in the audience here share, then, then you're going you're to work on it and you're going to keep at it until you succeed. And you're not going to be scared of failing. Yeah. So yeah, maybe, maybe an F shouldn't always be an F. But, I, you know, I think having mentored a lot of masters and PhD students in engineering, uh, as long as they make the effort, as long as they're making the progress towards the goal, uh, you can evaluate their scientific method. Just really the process again. Did they, did they really put the scientific process to the problem? Did they understand the problem from that standpoint? And whether or not they make it or not, at least in our lab, is, is, is less valued than the scientific process. I, I think the way that we, we uh, you know, rank students as they're getting educated uh, is, is a lot about encourages them to make sure every single project turns out well, every single assignment is, is, is done well. Um, and so it discourages uh, risk. So maybe instead of calculating uh, grade point average, we need to calculate grade point median. <laughs> that would drop yeah, any yeah, failures. Drops, I mean, of, you drop the low ones, yeah, the outliers, yeah. right? And that would be the high ones too, though. Which there, might be, there might be some quibbling on that, right? Uh, all right, well, let's, let's, uh, I'd love to get your sense of, in general, you know, I'm, I, I suggested at the outset that innovation is alive and well in this country. Do you, do you all believe that firmly? Is, is, and w to what extent are there barriers to innovation that we need to address, particularly as we look at these grand challenges? You want to take it down the line, start with you, John? Well, actually, I mentioned a little bit about that when I referred to your comments earlier. The uh, innovation is alive and well. The scientific advances are phenomenal. Uh, that genomic prize will be won someday. Uh, the, the pace of uh, genomic screens is unbelievable, and drugs are more and more tailored to uh, genomic data. And certainly, in all our studies, we consent patients for a genomic component. The uh, challenge right now, as a number has talked about, it costs so much to have the medical innovations and the access to capital during economic tough times. and. A uh, number of the issues are going on in healthcare now makes it very difficult for smaller companies. Uh, the h most highly innovative things will find funding. I, you know the types of stuff you've been talking about, Mark. Yeah. The, they're, they're, I, I can't imagine an economy so bad that there wouldn't be funding for those types of innovations that uh, dramatically change the way people's lives could be. So capital is flowing, if the idea is good enough still. Yeah, yeah. it's just uh, we've said a number of things here. Is, uh, Peter made the comment that it's a really bad idea until the day, until the day it's successful, and so is that type of judgment. The uh, our HIV product now is used in 90% of patients starting AIDS therapy, and we rescued that from a dead program. That you know, there's a broad consensus that that was not worth working on, hmm. and so the uh, uh, the. Uh, Maybe the types of medical research that might sound more risky or far-fetched, it's harder to get funding and harder to get the large amount of funding 
to carry it through the various stages before you actually know if it's going to be successful. Now, Peter, when you were telling your story about being told no repeatedly, this was at a time when the economy was entirely different than it is today. Can, can you imagine start, trying to start from scratch on the X Prize idea in this environment? And does that say anything about uh, how innovation is being properly funded or not these days? So I want to turn the question a little bit. The question is, is innovation alive and well? In the, and it's in, in what sphere, in what sectors, right? Because innovation uh, on iPhone apps is doing great. Uh, the question is, is that going to really change the world? So well, it could. Uh, you know, yeah. it's, it, it could. And, but, you know, in, in these, you know, in, we pulled up NIE's Grand Challenge for Engineering book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are, is innovation in these Grand Challenges alive and well? Uh, are we, what I don't see, what I really would love to see, is uh, the, you know, the, the guts, the, the cojones, I think is the right word, of going, of <laughs> Apollo once again, of the, uh, of the Human Genome Project. Literally, to say, you know, we're about to hit the 50th anniversary of JFK's speech going to the moon again. So the question is, what's the equivalent? You know, what is the, uh, what are the things that are going to challenge uh, the best minds in this nation, perhaps around the world, to do things that will transform society because the tools are now available to much, uh, to much smaller groups. Um, so that's my question. Are we going to set out those grand challenges uh, in a fashion that uh, really challenges the greatest minds around the world to solve the biggest problems? Is the U.S. still the home of innovation in your opinion? It, it is, but uh, it is, you know, it can quickly be lost. We have three decades ahead of us. This next decade is the biotech decade. We're going to see more, more growth and more, more money created, more innovation than we have in the internet decade in the last 10 years. After that, we're going to hit AI and robotics. And after that, we're going to hit nanomaterials, nanomachines, nanotechnology. And if China or India or another nation takes the lead in that, uh, they'll eat our lunch. Why? Because they are trillion dollar industries. Uh, that you know, we are in this nation uh, uh, basically living on the innovation we created in the internet, on the PC world that we've led for the last 20 years. And we still maintain a leadership role. We outsource a lot and so forth. But biotech, AI, robotics, nanotech uh, will put those industries to shame. So those are up for grabs then? Those are, are, we're just at the knee of the curve. And the question is what investment, what industries, I mean, uh, will the, you know, the Cisco's, the Apple's, the Google's and all of those be born in those industries outside of our national walls uh, or our national borders? I don't know. Mark, what do you think? Innovation <coughs> report. Well, I am always an optimist, so I yeah. definitely think it's alive and well. But uh, let me just share some, some experiences with you in the sense that, uh, you know, for the artificial retina, we're re-engineering the brain. The retina is part of the brain, and we're re-engineering the code that goes from your eye to the brain that this chip has to do, and that obviously fits in with one of the grand challenges. But um, as I said, I went to you know a Department of Energy laboratory, and I found this great technology, and I want to use it towards this this effort. And it's difficult because the Department of Energy doesn't really fund this area. You have to NIH, and so you get into yes, there's funding out there, but it sure would be great to be able to go to all the wonderful labs, find the greatest scientific candy. <laughs> uh, on, 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 the, on the shelves and be able to mix and match and be able to develop these therapies. I mean, another example was that Jet Propulsion Laboratory hyperspectral camera. So I think, you know, can we actually help the funding and the political climate such that, that we can just be pervasive, NSF, NIH, DOE, we can mix and match? Maybe some percent, 10 or 15, 20 percent of their budget is for interagency type of involvement because that's what's really uh, needed, at least in my experience, that was well, incredible. And the tragedy would be if a, if a great idea just sat on the shelf at one of these labs and never got, saw the light of day. Do you think that happens? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the technology that's available for weapons in, in some of these labs is amazing. And the consequences and how much it could help a lot of the, the, the medical technologies we're talking about is, is staggering. <laughs> it's just that, you know, we need to make that connection. We need to, we need to enable that portal uh, we need to make that possible, so.
I, you know, I suppose that gets into our next panel a little bit. It's a policy issue as well, as much as anything. But you know, right. the, obviously, the, you know, the, the, the culture of the labs over the years was not necessarily to share things. So I guess it puts them in a different uh, view of the, of the world. I guess. Right. right. All right, Jeff. What do you, what's your thought of uh, I think, innovation I think, right now? I'm an optimist as well because I get to see it, you know, every day, and I do think it's alive and well in this country. And I think it is fundamentally. Uh, I was wondering on the way out here, if you think about it, a lot of innovation comes out of this state, out of California. Uh, and, and you ask why, and I think it's the creative spirit, which is true across the whole country. And if you can combine the creative spirit with, um, with fundamental freedoms and fundamental assurance that your intellectual capital uh, is going to be protected, innovation will stay alive and well uh, in this country. I don't worry so much about the money, frankly, in that uh, there's a famous quote, and I'll forget who said it, the physicist, that... Uh, who gathered his people together when they ran out of money and said, we have no money, now we have to think. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I think scarcity can really breed innovation. I mean, India is a great example, uh, a lot of innovation coming out of India. And I think in large part because it, uh, of scarcity. You know, you're forced to figure out how to make do with what you have and put things together in inventive ways. Um, so I'm an optimist. I, I, I do think it's alive and well. Paul? I think just uh, the best thing that the United States can do to try to keep innovation going is to culturally value it. And as students are, uh, you know, deciding what to major in, deciding how hard they want to work in school, just knowing that there are, uh, you know, reward systems that reflect the value to the culture uh, that are there. There's a big problem, which is that, um, you know, kids who focus on math and science are stigmatized as nerds and geeks, and these are not. The, uh, the social archetypes that are, that are put up there, even on the movie screen. Uh, we still value you know, the, the businessman, the jock, all of these other archetypes that there's great examples for. And I think as long as our culture does not appreciate what it actually needs to survive, we have a problem. Uh, Jeff got one uh, specifically for you, but I suppose others can weigh in on this one from uh, Lumen. Uh, how can a corporation incentivize innovation by their employees while still reaching goals. One thing we do to great effect, and it's, uh, other companies do it as well, um, is the model where you create pools of seed money that can be made available to anybody. Small pools, like 20, 25K um, types of investments. You bring good ideas and you get this funding, and it's amazing what people will do uh, with some encouragement and knowledge that what they're producing uh, is going to be seen. So for that $25,000 or, or whatever it is, um, you can uh, really encourage your employees to be innovative within the corporate structure. We also have a competition we call Innovate the Future, uh, and that comes with, I believe it's a year of funding, uh, of IRAD funding from the company, uh, and we get hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of proposals. Uh, we announce the winners every fall, and some really innovative ideas come out of that. So I really think the important thing is to fence off a pool of resources, uh, and then make sure as people are working with that seed funding, if you will, they get the visibility because most, you know, most of us uh, are motivated by that visibility and by um, by having that access and that understanding um, throughout the corporation. So uh, seed funding is critical, uh, and then just celebrating those successes, talking about them, communicating those stories is critical. Right, Peter, this one's for you. Daniel uh, says this. He says X Prize is for a specific goal. The Nobel Prize is achievement oriented. Would it be good to have prizes for the parts that get to the goal? In other words. <laughs> That's a tougher one, isn't it? So, repeat that last part. Uh, uh, would, it be, would it be good to have prizes mm -hmm. for the, in other words, the steps along the way, yeah, not necessarily time. the ultimate you know, brass ring? So, one of the things we do look at when we're designing these X prizes are, is there interim steps? We just rolled out this year for the first time a new product we call X challenges, which are sort of a, an X prize is a, uh, a paradigm change global, you know, three to eight years to win paradigm change at the end. So we're looking at X challenges, which is sort of a one-year technology demo. And we're, um, we're looking at some challenges that might be to achieve uh, interim steps on the way to an X prize. I want to echo something that Jeff said a few minutes ago, which is the power of constraints. That if, if you give a group all the resources they need, the people, the money, the time, and so forth, ultimately humans get lazy and they don't really innovate. It's when you constrain an organization, you say you only have this much time or this much money or these many people, uh, that you force them to try and do things that are different and out of the box. So if you can couple clear constraints with a clear goal and what you're measuring along the way, um, 
you know, that's really a, a, a great uh, mix for innovation inside a company or inside an organization. Morgan asks this, should we be taking steps to retain foreign students, for example, his example given drop ITAR, uh, as opposed uh, to nation versus nation? Uh, anybody want to weigh in on that issue? I suspect that's something in, uh, Jeff deals with quite a bit. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, well, speaking more broadly, of course, you know, innovation comes through diversity. Diversity comes through um, broadly uh, accepting and taking um, ideas and working across, across the globe. Uh, and the history of the company, of course, is people that come here and get advanced degrees uh, and then have, in the past, stayed here and started companies. Uh, has been a great success story. More and more now they have vibrant economies back home and so they can go home and do that. Uh, I think, um, you know, absolutely. There's people that have suggested you ought to staple a green card to every PhD. Um, I think making sure Why those not? ideas, yeah. making sure those ideas, uh, having a really thoughtful Im immigration policy so that uh, we can tap into those ideas is, is important. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Well, no, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, we've had uh, a number of startup companies in the area, and, and the, the students uh, were, you know, foreign. They, they decided to stay. We had incredible difficulty in trying to. I'm not that involved, but whoever started, you know, was running those companies, obviously, had incredible difficulty to keep them uh, in the U.S. to do this groundbreaking research uh, and you have to write, you know, multiple uh, letters and so forth. I mean, it's doable and we do get them to stay because these, these students are absolutely at the top, but it does require a lot of paperwork and it's quite onerous. And to what President Shamo said earlier this morning, I mean, this is something that needs to be addressed and, and uh, fixed. Yeah, so. I'd throw a fireball and I think that uh, into your next panel here, I think, you know, that it's a travesty, the immigration uh, rules that we have right now. I mean, this nation is built on uh, immigrants from around the planet who came here and the fact that we don't, the fact that as a nation we don't actively attract the smartest people on the planet to come here and stay here is ridiculous. I mean, we should, it, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Let's applaud that one. I mean, we really, we really should be reaching out and saying, what's a, uh, what's a, a requirement for citizenship? <laughs> Well, and there's lots of requirements, lots of things, but if you're a brilliant person who cares about this nation, come, join us. We'd love your minds and your heart and your soul. Well, that's, that's how we got to where we are today, it isn't is. it? Let's not forget that. Mark, there was a question. You, you were talking about the labs and the difficulty dealing with the labs. Emmanuel asked this, does there need to be a shift from innovation through DOD and military funding, Department of Energy and so forth, to say another department, making it more easier to connect with the civilian world? Well, you know, I don't really know the answer or the mechanism to it. I hate to introduce yet another department because uh, <laughs> uh, usually I have to visit six of them to, to get anything done. And if it's seven, it may become more complicated. But, so we need is another bureaucracy, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, uh, but I think, you know, the, uh, the person who's asking the question is thinking along the correct lines. We have to have some mechanism that ties these wonderful organizations together. There's just too much science, too much wealth that we can immediately benefit from, uh, you know, and it's just not Tang. Remember Tang from uh, back in the day? I mean, you know, that got that much press from, uh, from uh, NASA and stuff. So I think there's a lot more to be harnessed and uh, gotten there. Uh, Lydia wants to know this, how do we make sure intellectual property doesn't discourage collaboration among universities, nations, companies, etc.? In other words, sharing no, sharing the knowledge, in other words. How do, you, how do you strike that balance? You want to get in on that one, John? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the most important thing for us is uh, not, not intellectual property is critical for, because uh, then you could not fund the innovations. But the most important thing of, uh, for us is access and in external intellectual property. Our budget, which is quite high for R&D, is far less than 1% of the money that's spent on the types of things we do. And there are fewer than 20 new drugs approved every year. So if we think we're going to do it with our own R&D budget, we're crazy. Yeah. And so we uh, have diverse collaborations around the world with all sorts of the best groups. The uh, nucleotide stuff that I described came out of a collaboration I started with a group in Prague in the Czech Republic 25 years ago. And we just, that's, it, it has to be in the DNA of the company. Right. Well, let's um, talk generally here for a moment. We had, we had a good tweet that caught my eye. Isn't America an experiment? This goes to what you were saying a little bit. The idea of democracy an experiment. So how do we reinvigorate 
that sense of experimentation in this country. Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Bonfires in the streets. Anybody have any thoughts? Big, you know, sweeping thoughts on that. So, yes, we are, revol we are a, uh, a, a giant experiment, but the experiment got locked in and the structure got put in place and whenever you don't put uh, uh, a built-in mechanism for rebooting, uh, you get stuck. And so... Uh, Are we of, stuck? Well, I mean, there's no place... So what's interesting was uh, 150 years ago, if, if something went wrong and you're living in the East Coast, you could, go to the, you could go to the West Coast, to the frontier, and start your life again. And, uh, and, and when you were on the frontier, it didn't matter whether you were male or female, black or white, whatever. If you were the best in that field, your skills rose you to the top. Uh, there's no place you can really go on this planet and restart, uh, which those of you who want to travel with me to the cosmos, you know, uh, the beautiful <laughs> thing about it, <laughs> it all ends up in space in the final result. You know, it's funny. I just saw Elliot Spitzer on CNN. He's restarted. I, he, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe CNN let's, is the place. Let's I don't not know. go there, Miles. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but you know there will be uh, if you stop in, in in the future someday when we are moving off the planet, there will be the chance for grand experiments once again in governance and nation states and so forth. If you want to go and practice, you know, pure uh, capitalism, you can do that on your O'Neill colony. If you want to go and practice something else, you can do it somewhere else. So, but there is, you know, when we have physical constraints, that may be possible in cyberspace where we'll live in a virtual reality and go and create new virtual forms of government where we can do large experiments and then the things that work the best bring them back into the physical world and say we run the experiment this works better let's adopt it any other thoughts on this well you know I, I'll wait to go to the cosmos too with you uh, and it's very exciting uh, but you know I think another way you can think about it is uh, internal division so what happens is uh, large companies form and they become very regimented and they become very rule uh, dominated and so forth and so what happens is a little spin-off comes off and so you're getting subdivision of the larger organism or larger entity and that organism can then move and reinvent itself and then it gets big and then it becomes cumbersome and <laughs> can't invent it's got all these rules and then it subdivides again so it's like and if you look at it uh, I kind of I kind of view it as these multiple subdivisions that continue to reinnovate um, on this planet, and you know, we look forward to innovating uh, abroad as well, extraterrestrial areas. Jeff, yeah, the example I was thinking of uh, was, you know, the Defense Department had a successful, um, I would say, effort in experimentation in that sense. Talking about splitting something else out is that it takes a long time to acquire a system. If you print out the DoD 5000, which is the federal acquisition uh, for DoD, it's literally you know five six feet high. Uh, it takes a while to get through that system, but they had a real problem. We had a real problem as a nation and people being uh, killed in theater by in, uh, IEDs. Uh, and so what the de department did was sort of set up the separate office, this sort of rapid fielding approach um, that said, okay, I know you have to do that paperwork eventually, but we got lives to save and we can do it. We can bring innovation to bear, um, you know, first start by throwing out the rules, right? Uh, and then over time, you know, to your point, the rules start to kind of creep back in. Um, and so you just have to keep uh, experimenting and just keep doing that. If, if the stakes are high enough, uh, the human spirit is such that we'll find a way to make it work. Paul? I think in the academic arena, there's great checks and balances on making sure things don't get entrenched and that there's continuous innovation. Because when you submit a paper for publication, uh, if, it, if it smells at all of something that someone else or, or, or you published even six months ago, uh, it, it just gets rejected in, in, in flames. And there's a lot of reward structure in, you know, in academic research to try to recognize where the innovation actually happened, not just where the people who capitalized on it, um, uh, uh, where that actually happened. And I, I think in the commercial marketplace, it's more the people who commercialize uh, things or who manage to take advantage of a new technology who get most of the rewards rather than the people who actually uh, come up with it. There's certainly a lot of stories like that. So maybe finding ways to apply the academic model more broadly could help. All right, we have a few minutes left. Take out your crystal balls and give us some predictions about the innovations in your respective fields. Uh, Peter, you're all over the map, so you pick whatever you want as far as the field. <laughs> but but um, in your respective fields, uh, where you see uh, the innovations, wh 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 what's the exciting thing we should be watching? Start with my yeah. okay. 
Well, it, I, mean, I, I think the crystal ball has been, uh, or the image has been much clearer over the last few years with the genomic revolution. And the problem is, is people take drugs and they can work in 10% of the people, it can work in 90%, depending upon the drug. Um, cancer therapeutics is where it's happening the fastest. Uh, we know cancer drugs are only going to work for, any particular drug will only work for a small subset. And we're learning how to identify the individuals that the drugs will work best for. And so what we're, uh, we're, we're rapidly going into the era of personalized medicine. I mentioned for about a decade now, we know exactly what drug to treat an AIDS patient with because we, we sequence the virus and we know which drugs will work. And that's become more broadly applied into other diseases. So we're going to cure cancer? Uh, I don't know about cure <laughs> cancer, but we, we'll have better treatments that uh, induce more remissions or are used for the right patients and um, help people live longer. And what drugs really do is help people live longer, healthier lives. That's what we've seen over the last few decades. Peter, what innovations are you predicting? So uh, I just got a contract to write a, a book called Abundance uh, from Simon Sister. And the concept is that uh, exponentially growing technologies are going to transform the world in such a way that we're going to allow everybody on this planet to live in a time of abundance. Not a life of luxury, but a life of possibility. So I see uh, huge breakthroughs in energy uh, coming down the line to the point where we'll have energy abundance. Uh, once you have that, really? you have Boy, absolutely... You, 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 uh, you're a long you way from Malthusian, aren't you? Uh, clean, clean water. You know, we have plenty of water on this planet. It's just, you know, 97.6% is in the form of salt water. Uh, I see bioengineering, uh, a lot of the work coming out of that, giving us uh, another green revolution. I see uh, the ability for, for food abundance. Uh, the telecom and knowledge uh, abundance that exists today is ultimately going to give us the capacity for uh, education and healthcare abundance on the planet. So I see a multitude of revolutions coming down the line that are going to reinvent this planet in a very significant fashion. I think it's hard for people to see all that right now. It is. I mean, the midbrain, our amygdala, you know, <laughs> genetically born from uh, millions of years, we see always the negative side, the fearful side. You know, it's why your past, you know, your industry is always about negative news. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it sells soap. Yes, it does. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Mark, uh, innovations in your field. Will, well, will blind that, people truly be able to see like that, do you think? I mean, is, is that... Uh, well, I, you know, I think in terms of the artificial retina, we're making some good breakthroughs in uh, currently rudimentary vision, but... You know, to get it to reading and color vision are all things that we're very hopeful about. But uh, the larger picture is to use the principles of engineering, uh, to use them uh, to both lengthen uh, the, and increase the quality of life. And, and what am I talking about? I'm, not, I'm talking about in the future you would have biomimetic implants, bioelectronic implants that are half, half biology, half electronics. They can deliver drugs, they can sense physiology, they can possibly restore lost function. So this whole new genre of biomimetic implants, bioelectronic implants, I think are really going to uh, play a bigger, bigger role. We've, we've obviously been involved in the eye, colleagues of are involved in cognitive function, uh, Ted Berger and others. So I, I'm really optimistic about that and I think future they can deliver drugs, monitor. Um, health, and I think they'll make a big, big difference. So then the lines between machines and humans becomes very blurry, doesn't it, over time as we have well, more components like this? Right? I, th I, think, I think everybody's, the amygdala jumps in and says, oh my gosh, uh, you're turning me into a machine. But uh, I think uh, one of, uh, one of a good co colleague of mine who has actually uh, bilateral cochlear implants of bi bionic ears told, uh, wrote a book, and one of his famous uh, quotes is how uh, how the machine made me more human. So I think you have to look at this, and if you have an a impediment in, or a sensory loss, uh, these devices can actually make you, the quality of life and integrate you better into life is really the critical thing. So, yeah, don't let the amygdala scare you. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, crystal ball, I would say, <clears throat> if I only got to pick one in aerospace and defense, broadly speaking, uh, is gonna be true autonomy. We're nearing a tipping point there with autonomous systems that... Will we uh, be getting on airliners with no pilots someday? Getting a what? I'm sorry. Will we get on an airliner, remotely piloted, 
You know, by some guy in a shipping container. <laughs> <laughs> you may. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I would be surprised. Yeah. I think people want to walk in and look to the left and see a pilot. But, um, but you know, for, for military applications and, and other applications where you need to do a, a mission that uh, is in, either in harm's way or it's just hazardous for some, some reason, um, it, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, remotely piloted systems out there, both air, land, and sea, but they're just that. They're not really autonomous for the most part. They're remotely piloted. But the day that we can pass that tipping point towards, towards true autonomy um, and have these systems know what they need to do and do it, um, then you can really also get to come back to my affordability theme. You know, right now it's expensive to have a pilot, no matter where they're sitting, you know, piloting a remotely piloted vehicle. Uh, if you could have one pilot controlling ten, you know, in a swarm of some sort, uh, that really starts to bring down your cost and becomes affordability. So if I only got to pick one thing, I would say crystal ball-wise, autonomous systems are, are nearing a tipping point. Paul? So if you look at the effort that it takes for someone to write a great novel, I mean, you need a, a you know, computer and, and a single person can bang that out in a year. T to create a great movie right now is still uh, tens of millions of dollars and it requires one very Unless special Jim individual Cameron. who can take <laughs> What's up? Unless you're Jim Cameron. Unless you're James Cameron where it's dollars. hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> um, then uh, it, it, it's, it's an enormously huge operation. Well, ultimately, you know, visual storytelling is a tool for communication. So it can be used for uh, multiple kinds of things, not just entertainment. And I believe that with the improvements in computer graphics, how fast you can create it and how fast you can author it, we'll get to the point where a single person working for a year could create an amazing feature film mm. uh, or any other thing that they want to communicate. Any idea that's in your head, however vividly you would like to use uh, sound and image and even holographic projection at some point, that's going to be available to a far wider group of people than it's available to today. And hopefully we'll get a lot more ideas out there and communicate it. So, so what we see on YouTube might be a little better over time, huh? Not just <laughs> random skateboarding accents, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul Dubovic, Jeff Wilcox, Mark Humayan, Peter Diamandis, John Martin. Stand up. We have to take a picture while we get a round of applause here. Stand up and get the picture. Smile. Keep oh, right yeah, there. Get, the get in there. Get in there. <laughs> Great panel. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now, I think we're going to take a uh, little break. Is that right? Do we have anything coming up right now? I'm not sure. Stand by. Yes, let's take a break. We're taking a break. <laughs>